Uh, it's my pleasure to present Angus uh, and Steve, who are working on the HEAT project. Angus is a developer and Steve is a contributor. I guess that's, I'm not sure exactly what the difference is, but um, uh, um, yeah, without further ado, Angus and Steve. All right. Um, so you need that mic. Right, so just to clarify, we're both uh, core developers on the HEAT team. Uh, it's just our own personal terminology, I suppose. Uh, so start off with what is OpenStack. You probably all have, this is just trying to give a context because initially uh, some of the, the other OpenStack projects were left out of overviews and things. So um, you have the usual guys at the bottom. Um, and then there's some new projects coming along, um, Red Dwarf, Monica, uh, Libra. And there's actually a couple of different, I think there's two different versions of the load balance as a service, uh, Salometer and Heat. I've done them because they officially have gone into incubation and there's a dashboard. So I've also laid this just to show roughly who speaks to who. Uh, of course the load balancer is actually underneath the API of Quantum so it's not quite accurate. It's, um, it's, it's quite appropriate that um Heat is sort of sitting next to the web UI because I kind of think of them in, in a similar way in that they are both uh, consumers of all the client libraries of all those other bottom uh, projects, um, whereas Horizon, uh, the web UI, is obviously um, making client calls in response to user clicks. Um, heat is, is more automated. Yeah. So it's a, they're both REST APIs, the one's just pretty, and the other one's more of a mechanical API that you could program against. So yeah, heat, heat and Solarometer are, are going through an incubation process. Um, uh, at the at the end of the Grizzly cycle, uh, will apply to become an official um, uh, OpenStack project, um, and will either be approved or will go through another cycle or something. And and in, in theory, those these boxes in the white will will be able to start an incubation. Um, so it's, it's a way of, of bringing projects in in a cohesive way. Uh, no, the incubation process, I think, works quite well. At least, well, ask me again after we've been approved. <laughs> so this is a, trying to give you the big picture of what he does. Uh, it's a bit of a cheesy name, but basically what gets your application from a template and some user parameters up into the cloud? Heat. So um, basically it, you write a full template that, gives, that can start up a multi-tiered, uh, sort of multi-instance, all sorts of resources in it. Um, Pass the user parameters, and he will drive the API of all the other projects uh, to instantiate. So yeah, it's all about um, creating resources within OpenStack, um, and then once those resources are created, uh, wiring them together into a complete working application. So uh, why focus on template-based orchestration? So I think we've heard a little bit from Puppet why. Obviously, working from a text file is a good idea. Conversion, your infrastructure, like your version software, uh, and repeatability is really important. And uh, you can use one API, so you could just speak to Heat. You wouldn't have to speak to any of the other APIs. It makes it simpler to <coughs> operate it. Um, and you can then start talking about your higher level application, which may include many instances, as one entity. So it helps to group and make things a bit more logical. Yeah, so just a couple of examples. Um, as far as repeatability goes, um, uh, we've created some uh, native uh, quantum resource types that um, allow you to um, quickly spin up a, a full quantum configuration uh, based off a single template. Um, really, the only practical way of doing that previously was, you know, a, a Hairy shell script, which uh, did the individual quantum calls and um, you know, pulled out the UUIDs and pushed them back into the subsequent call. So, being able to do that, you know, easily and repeatedly is, is you know, very useful. And and again, as for having a single API to um, to access all of OpenStack, um, you know, you you can imagine another, another scenario as, as as soon as you're you're using two different types of uh, OpenStack resources and you want one to know about the other, then you're then you're doing client calls and, and trying to figure out your UIDs and getting everything configured. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a hassle. So this is, this is you know, one, one way to make it a, a lot I, easier. I think we've had a, a, quite a few projects and talks about orchestration on top of cloud. And I think it simply highlights 
bit of a missing gap and, and people need, I feel like the, the OpenStack API, although very powerful, is not always easy to use for an end user and it's helpful to have an orchestration layer on top um, <coughs> just to make your life a bit easier. So it's, it's probably valuable to point out at this point that Heat started as a, as a uh, implementation of, of uh, Amazon's CloudFormation in, in OpenStack. Um, CloudFormation is a, is a sort of JSON-based template file um, which, you, which you throw at AWS and it, and it, and it brings, up your, um, brings up your cloud. Um, but it's, it's kind of evolving beyond that. Um, you know, CloudFormation was chosen, you know, we, we had to make up a user when there was no code. You know, what, 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 is, what does this user want to do? They want to migrate from Amazon to, to OpenStack. Um, so, okay, fine. And they're using CloudFormation, so, so let's, let's implement that. But now we have um, real users with you know, real use cases and more of an OpenStack specific focus. It's most definitely evolving into a, into a fairly um, you know, generic OpenStack orchestration platform rather than something that's just a, a shim from something else. So we still support, we're not planning on throwing away that AWS uh, yes, it's, 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 it's like, it's like the um, Nova compatibility for EC2. It's, it's, it's always going to be there. It's important to us, um, but uh, the emphasis is on the native stuff because it's better. Um. So uh, this is uh, the YAML version of the template. So basically it's a direct translation which is mechanically convertible uh, between YAML and JSON. Uh, just showing you the different uh, sections. Uh, version, description, parameters are, are basically how you define um, what are your, the parameters that you want to allow to pass in. And there's a lot more, like you can see the loud values, there's quite a lot of uh, scope for testing the input. Um, so those basically you can reference anywhere, so you can see here reference instance type and that'll get automatically substituted as it becomes available. So the other Things like uh, when you reference the wiki server, like here, uh, once that's created, it'll get substituted, and when you do a show stack, you'll end up with your actual IP. So the output is stuff that you find useful that you want outputted out of all of this. Yeah, so, so with, with the output, you can, you can expose uh, particular properties that, that the different resource types have um, into, uh, into the real world. You know, useful things like what is the URL of the web server I've just spawned? Because it's going to be different every time because I might have a different IP address. Um, so yeah, parameters. Um, that's that's what the user passes in when they when they invoke heat on the command line. Um, so we can yeah, as as I said, we can validate those. Um, yeah, uh, we've, we've just this is this is the first version of the of the YAML format. It is it is quite literally a a. Uh, it, it passes to the exact same structure as the as the the old JSON format, and in fact, JSON is a is a subset of of YAML. Um, but JSON is a is a terrible uh, file format for a uh, for a template for file. Also, not really for it. It's lovely for us to parse it yeah. in the engine. It's really nice and mechanical. And but to it read it, uh, it's easy to make. As a as a wire Errors. as a wire protocol, it's great. Um, but you know. You, you, if, you're, if you're doing complex templates, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a bit of trial and error involved. You're really going to be able to, I don't know, comment out bits and see if it doesn't work. You know, maybe add some, add some block comments to explain what's actually going on. You can't do any of that with, with, uh, with JSON. Um, yeah, so, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's one technology factor that, that drives some people away from cloud formation. Um, you know, I'm not using this. It's done with JSON. It's ridiculous. Look this language. So at least you know we've got past that. Um, we're we're going to we'll continue to involve the, uh, evolve the, the YAML format, um, really focusing on what what users need um, to to bring up templates. Um, so this is this is just the first version. Um, if if it's you know if, if there's a feature that's not in there yet, it's you know it's not the end of the world. So um, yes, yeah, trying to show the breadth of of resource types and just to try and show we're not. We're not just configuration management. We have, and you can use many other configuration management systems that are confined. It's not descriptive. The idea is it's driving the actual API of the other OpenStack projects, which translates into resource types. And there's others that are built on top, for instance, like order scaling, nested stacks, load balancers, and other things which you can create um, with virtual machines, essentially. 
Um, so instances volumes, floating IP, S3 is provided by Swift, um, security groups, but limited user support because it doesn't, AWS user, user <coughs> doesn't necessarily transla translate nicely to Keystone. But we have some limited support for it. And we have a minimalist CloudWatch implementation and we're basically looking to get the monitoring aspect into Solometer at the moment. <coughs> Um, so with that CloudWatch functionality, you can have order scaling and um, load balancer as well. Yeah, so the, the resource types in this, in this left column, these are, and, and, and these ones here, they comply to the CloudFormation spec. Um, but because, you know, we have to basically have a shim between uh, Amazon's semantics and and OpenStax um, that you know makes them a bit more complex than than they would be if they were native uh, native resource types. Um, so these these th well, these three down here um, uh, are heat specific, and we're, we're just going to go through each each OpenStack project and and create uh, native resource types for for those. And they really are just. Um, the very thin wrappers over, over API calls. And I think, I mean, the main purpose for making OpenStack specific resources is because OpenStack has features that AWS doesn't and vice versa. So you don't want to have the, the worst of both worlds. You want to try and expose the best of both if possible. Yeah, we're, we're going to have to be careful about how we do instance because that's, that's where all the magic happens. Um, so we want to do it, when we implement that in a native way, we're, we're going to have to figure out how to do it in a way that, that um, means we're not, you know, supporting a lot of code. We'll, we'll get as much reuse in, in there as possible. Okay, so going through the architecture, basically we, we were trying to do this um, like how other um, OpenStack projects operate. You've got a REST server, uh, which speaks by MQV to the engine, which has a database entries, you know, you keep the stack and information about all their resources. Um, keeps the original template so you can update it and it can compare, see what's different. So uh, once it's gone and created it, um, there are certain resources like uh, watch conditions which need to signal back to the heat API that it's truly finished. So not just started as far as Nova's concerned, but actually fully configured and ready to go. So that way you can say, build this instance but don't start until the other one is completely ready. So that's why you need to, we have a, a wait condition rest call that comes back out. And the other one there is, is so that you can post uh, statistical information back to CloudWatch and do things like auto, auto scaling. So this, this architecture is, is, has been chosen to um, use the same techniques that other OpenStack projects use to, to get scalability. Um, so, you know, the APIs you know, just scale horizontally because they're, they're, they're stateless. So you do the usual um, high availability story there. Um, we can use the same uh, message bus as, as, um, as the rest of the OpenStack services do in the, in the controller network. Um, heat engine, we need to do a little bit more work there to, to get it scaling out, um, you know, but you know, it'll, it'll, it'll happen when it, when it needs to. Um, and DB, you can, you, you know, do whatever um, HA policy you have for the for the rest of your um, for your OpenStack. Um, but I mean, but this you know this architecture is quite complicated um, for something that is essentially just um, making a series of client calls on your OpenStack. So uh, another thing that we that we'll look at in the future at some point is um, wrapping all this up in, in some single uh, single entity, maybe a single daemon that can actually live outside um, outside the OpenStack network. Um, so at, at, at the moment, um, it needs to be deployed within your infrastructure. Yeah. So so if, if you're if you're a user who, who uses clouds and you want to use Heat, um, you'll get to use Heat if your cloud provider chooses to install it for you and, and offer it offer it as a service. But it's, it's just like um, all of the other you know slightly higher level services like database as a service. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of database as a service you know cloud products out there. Um, it's entirely up to you whether, whether you want to use them. It either, it either meets your needs or it doesn't. Um, and, and just because it's there doesn't mean you, you, you must use it or, or some other solution you know, doesn't meet your needs better. So you know, it's, it's, it's all about offering 
choice to to um, to users of clouds. You know, we think cloud providers should install it because you know it adds value and all that stuff. Um, and users will evaluate it for what it is, and they'll use it if it meets their needs. You know, it's, um, that's that's sort of the way we're approaching it. So, um, as far as image requirements, but, uh, we really just need your base uh, operating system and cloud in it. Uh, cloud in it goes and installs, you know, the key and runs user data uh, and saves away the metadata. So, it's pretty simple, really. So, we currently support uh, Fedora, Ubuntu, Debian, RHEL. Um, it shouldn't be a big deal supporting others. We just haven't had users asking. Um, and if the image doesn't install our little CNF tools, it, it will automatically just to try and make it basically more um, more approachable to use generic images. And uh, obviously, the the image is going to boot faster. If you have a complicated instance with a lot of packages, um, you can basically trade off whether you want to start with a really simple image and install everything and configure everything, or if you're going to use that image a lot. It's going to be faster if you pre-install the packages on and then only configure later, because it will just boot so much faster if you don't have to sit there installing packages. Yeah, so, so one, I mean, one you can make that trade off yourself. One one core feature of, of Heat is, is the ability to define templates that have auto scaling rules, um, you know, based on based on load in the instances. Um, so if, if, if a rule triggers and it starts cranking up instances, you don't really want them then installing um, HTTP, D, and PHP over the network before your instance can actually come online and, and you know, meet that extra demand. Um, so right now it's a little bit of a drag to create um, customized in instances. Um, but there's a lot of tools out there, but it's not well integrated. Sometimes you need a full virtualization stack to do it. Um, I suspect, yeah, I suspect there'll be a um, There'll be an open stack project that provides us as a service at some point. So um, at the moment, we've, we've made a wrapper just to try and make life a bit easier. Heat, Geos, um, and a couple of common flavors that you might want to pick just to build the basics. And then you can basically edit your own uh, Oz XML template and add extra packages and then create it like that. So, and that also registered with Glance. So just trying to wrap that up and make it a bit easier. Um, so I'm actually going to do a technical demo today, um, even though I was told that was a stupid idea and it will go wrong. Um, so I wanted it to be completely offline. I didn't want to have network issues causing issues, causing problems. Um, so I wrapped, I, I created my own image which had everything on it that it, that it needed. So I could, I could just quickly show you the, um, the Oz template that we ended up with. So it's just an XML file. Um, it's, it's, uh, it uses the, uh, the Fedora ISO, install ISO. Um, uh, it's, it's adding a repository to, to get um, my, um, the heat CFN tools RPM. And then it's just specifying a list of packages that it, that it needs. Um, and then further down, I can, I can, after the install is run, I can run arbitrary commands. Um, so here I'm just, just you know, creating a user to log in as. Um, Grabbing some extra files for the for the demo, um, doing a yum update to make sure everything's up to date, and and that's it. It, it creates a wraps it up into a QCAR image, and and um, then I can upload it into into Glance. So uh, yeah, it's just a quick show of the heat command and uh, a couple of the commands you'll see. Yeah, so if, if, you're, Stevia, yes. if you're familiar with any of the other um, OpenStack clients, um, it has you know, the usual um, you know, noun verb um, command combos. Um, the, 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 the big entities that, that we're dealing with here is um, stacks. Um, that's what's created when you, when you launch a template. Um, so the template's just the text file. Um, within a stack, it creates a, a collection of resources. Um, so the commands there, you know, the stack and resource. There's, there's other ones like um, like events. Uh, resource can, resources can generate events. So there's there's some commands to to, to find out what's what's happening there as well. Um, but it's all fairly standard um, OpenStack stuff if you're familiar with it. Get cracking. Right. Time to do the actual demo. So. Uh, 
Um, I just wanted to demonstrate, um, bring up a template, um, wiring together different kinds of, of uh, OpenStack resources, um, and then showing it doing something actually actually useful. So uh, we've got, we've got a, an instance in which we're going to put MediaWiki on. Um, got some networking stuff so we can access it, um, and I've actually got some Swift containers. Um, I've, I've just last week wrote the the, the Swift resources. Uh, to um, which you know ve fairly thinly wraps the, um, the the Swift client calls. Um, you know, it's a, it's a it's a fairly simple um, API, so it, you know it, it was it was pretty quick to put together. Um, so let's uh, yeah. So what I've got here, I've got I've got DevStack running, and I'll just show you I'll just show you what processes are going. So, oops. So we've got Swift running in a, in a single node mode, so there's absolutely no redundancy or you know, any of the other things that Swift is actually good at, but it's, it's, it's enough for development because you can put files in and get files out. Um, then we've got you know, the default set of, of OpenStack uh, processes that's running here. At the bottom we've got these four H ones. So the first one is uh, Heat Engine. Uh, that, that does the actual... Uh, OpenStack client calls to, to generate resources and and, um, and and find out the state of all the resources. Um, we've got Heat API, which is a um, standard REST interface, um, which you can use either with the official um, Heat client or or yourself by doing by building your own REST calls. Um, we've got the compatibility Heat CloudFormation API, which is sort of kind of resty RPC. Bleh. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's there for compatibility, um, and you know it's well supported. Um, and we've got a, a CloudWatch API as well. So Cloud, CloudWatch um, provides the monitoring, um, lets us get the data that that we need for you know auto scaling decisions. Pretty availability. minimalist. It's not a full implementation. Yeah, so we're, we're just it's, it's basically just enough to uh, for us to to flesh out our functionality. Um, eventually, a project, most likely Solometer. Will will provide this um, this CloudWatch compatible monitoring capability, um, so that yeah, um, so this is you know very much stopgap, uh, but we needed something now. Um, so I'll just detach from that. So let's run some commands. Um, oops, I keep on forgetting it's the old command. Oops. Not that way. So, heat, there's nothing there. Um, I just need to set up some environment stuff. Um, what else? Keep here. So, I'm just creating you know, basic security group rules and um, generating a keep here um, so that I can and SSH into the boxes well. when some things go wrong. Um, so, all right, let's launch a stack. So that's obviously not the command Steve's just made. So no, a, a little we make file just to make life a bit easier. I'm guilty of make file abuse. So there's the actual command up here. Heat stack create. Okay, so stuff's happening. I'll um So we're in state as create in progress. There's a lot running on this machine, so it's gonna take a while to crank up. Um so let's just have a poke around and see what's happening while it's while it's grinding up. Um So my, my stack name uh, is Catipedia. That's um, this is a, a, a name which is which is unique within my um, OpenStack user tenant. environment. Tenant, yeah. Tenant, uh, yes, yes, tenant. Um, so I'll just see what resources are going on here. Okay, so we've got the networking stuff. It's good to go. Um, we've got three Swift containers have been created, and we've got the instance which is still in progress. You know, as you would expect. Um, so while while that Nova process is cranking up, let's uh, yep, it's still in build status. So I'll just uh, see what's going on in Swiftland. OK, 
Okay, so we've got uh, three Swift containers that have appeared. Um, and we'll, all, we'll, all prefixed with the stack, so names yeah, don't so, clash. So I've got a bit of a namespace here, so if, if, I, if I launch that stack with a, with a different name, then, then I can have that stack running twice and there won't be any uh, conflicts anywhere. Um, so while that's, while that's tuning away... Um, you want to have a look at the template map? Yeah, so by the way, any questions, just um, ask away. So this is another YAML template. Um, bunch of parameters at the top. Some of these uh, parameters are just were just expedient to to get this demo going. Like you, you wouldn't really pass in the the auth server. It just so happens that I'm creating an instance, which is then making uh, OpenStack calls itself. Um, so so we need to get that in, you know, somehow. Um, but then we get into to um, application specific um, configuration, like the password for the media wiki um, uh, sysops user. Um, and the, the root password for, for MySQL. Um, we've got Linux distribution here, and back at the top there was um, instance type. Um, so in the mapping section, um, we, we, we have the lookup tables, um, so we can go from Linux distribution um, and architecture. No, from the size, the uh, flavor, and the distro and you'll get an image. Yeah, so we specify flavor. Because um, you don't have to do this at all. You can just pass in the, the image ID raw. This is just to try and make it a bit nicer from our, from our commonly used templates so that we can, you know, start up a different distro or, you know, start up a different size and instead of having to remember exactly what all the image IDs are. Yeah, so you, you might want to launch it on a small, the, the smallest instance that it'll work on for, d for development purposes, then it'll be cheaper, and you just kill it when you're done, and, and then crank it up on the, on the production size. Um, so then we get into the resources section. Uh, so we've got the, 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 uh, the networking stuff. Um, then we're into a, uh, the Swift containers. So here is a, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Swift API, but here's an example of uh, where I'm setting a header. I, I, I need this uh, container to be visible to, to everyone because it's going to be directly serving content to, to browsers. Um, so I'm adding container read to, to star. Um, and that's, that's just, that's exactly how the header's named in the, in the API itself. Um, I'm giving it a name using the join function. So it's, it's um, join, joined with hyphen Site ID public, so that's why we saw Katypedia hyphen public in the in the Swift list. Um, I've got another uh, another container called another container. This one doesn't have a, an explicit name in the properties, um, just to demonstrate that it'll it'll show up as something else when when we run Swift list again. And then we get into the instance itself. Um, so it's already got everything installed. I, I could specify a bunch of packages that it installs here, um, but I know it's all installed, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, but I do need to start the services that, that, that I'm, I'm using. Then we need to figure out which image ID, so we're, we're doing this sort of double, double map lookup to, to end up with, a, with a, an actual image that we can, we, we can launch. Um, and you see where there's, there's, there's several refs throughout here. You can, you can, you can ref uh, parameters, um, you can ref other resources in other resources, um, and that's, and that's uh, how you wire things together. Um, so that's, that's how you find out what IP address you've been assigned. Um, and it's internally it will create dependencies based on those references, and so if it needs to find an instance, it'll, if it needs an instance ID, it'll go and create that instance so it can actually get the ID <coughs> and substitute it. So from user data onwards, it's, um, this, is, this is the package that cloud in image will, um, will get onto my instance and, um, and make sure it gets executed. Um, so we're calling CFN init. That's, that's the, um, the heat CFN tools um, script, which will tell, um, tell heat that the instance is started and it's alive and we're good to go. Um, then it's just essentially a, a, a hacky provisioning script. In a, in a real example, this is where it would hand off to Puppet or, or whatever um, configuration tool you're, you're, you're most comfortable with. Or, or it could be just the, the, the script that you need to get it going. It's, you know, it's agnostic to, to how you do it from this point on. 
but what I need to do is generate a, um, a local settings file um, for MediaWiki. So, so it's generating the, the file itself, um, and then it needs to append a bunch of stuff to the end of it um, to, to wire in Swift. So this, this demo is, is, is demonstrating um, MediaWiki's integration with uh, using Swift as a storage backend uh, for, the, for the files. Um, interestingly, um, the, the Swift client library, which, um, which MediaWiki uses, um, only understands uh, Keystone V1 authentication, um, which is common when you're using Swift standalone or when you're using um, public clouds like Rackspace, and I, don't, I assume HP still use, um, supports V1. Um, but V1 has, in fact, been dropped from, from Keystone um, a couple of releases ago, so it didn't work out of the box. Um, so one little bit of PHP rage hacking I had to do was, was to get PHP uh, V2 um, authentication working. Um, so I'll, I'll, I can tidy it up and get it upstream. But if, if, you, if, you, if you find some Swift client code in the wild which only does V1, then, then supporting V2 you know, it would be a nice little change that you could contribute back. Um, the major difference between the two protocols is um, V1 does everything with headers, um, V2 does everything with JSON um, packets. So it's, it's, it's not a huge change. Um, so the rest of this file, it's, it's, all, it's all just setting up the, the Swift Cloud Files um, configuration so that it can um, poke content into Swift and get it back out again. Um, I'll just scroll down here. See here we've got um, um, we're getting an attribute from the public container resource that we define further up the screen, um, and we're getting the website URL, uh, which is the full path including the container. Um, and MediaWiki really needs to know that so that it can it can serve the content. So I think you can see this is a bit messy, and it's because um, of this, the way we do substitution. So I think that's one function we need to make is to be able to do the substitution in a bit of a neater way so you, the user data is a lot more readable. Yeah, so, so YAML supports um, block, block text, um, but it, it has you know, uh, indent, indent rules for, for, for block text um, and lists, so it's, it's a bit white space um, sensitive. Um, you know, one space can change behavior, so it's not ideal. This, this file could be tidied up quite a lot if, if we could put a lot of this stuff in a, in a up at the top which you know, maybe sets PHP uh, variables which can be referenced further down. Um, again, you know, it's, it's, it's stuff like that that we'll be focusing on, um, making the, the user side of it um, and easier than, say, the way CloudFormation works at the moment. Um, and then right at the bottom, we've got, we can specify our own outputs. Um, I want to know what website URL to, to use once it's all, once it's all going. Um, so I'm building up a, a, a URL from, from the information that I have. And we've got another one which just calls into the um, into the Swift container to tell me how many objects it is. I'm calling that cat count, but for reasons you'll find out very soon. And I can also um, uh, squirt out entire blobs of JSON. So here's here's every single header that the public container has when you call um, head container on it. So let's see where um, where we're at. Still building. Mm. I'm not convinced. We'll give it a few more minutes, but I think this has died. Um, that's all right, you appear to have a last resort in the directory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to yeah, use that. Yeah, we did that, just a uh, <laughs> screencast earlier. So. Um, yeah, well, we could sit here and wait until Novelist says something else. It says error, okay. Blame Nova, it wasn't heat. <laughs> um, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, some other developers were saying, oh, we're just not going to do demos because it's 
it's really a lot of stress and, and so much prep and then chances are this kind of thing happens once well, well we tend to fit a lot, fix a lot of bugs around just before um, we do demos. Uh, I mean, so modify the number of bugs yeah. and features done just prior to pre demos. demos yeah. Yeah. Oh, we can use this as a, as a good example to, to to explain what happens when something when a, when a resource fails. Um, so we can see in the resource list it's, um, the instance has gone to create failed. Um, that that um, currently the current behavior is that if a resource fails, it just stops creating resources um, and leaves it up to you to, to figure out what's going on and clean it up. Well, so and the cleanup is easy, it's just delete yeah. that basically. Um, there are some options to uh, create, which are the um, fail type. So you can tell it to uh, you know, destroy on, on, on fail, and totally clean up or just leave it as is. It's leaving it as is is not a bad idea because it at least allows you to get in there and see actually what the problem is. Okay. Oh, look, it worked. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, media wiki installed. Um, it's still the default page. That means local settings isn't there yet. It's still churning away in the background. Um, <laughs> the screen recorder made it even slower. So let's just wait for it to uh, come to life. You've only got 10 minutes. You might want to fast forward. Should go any second now. Okay, so I've just run um, heat, heat show to get the URL. Okay, now I'm running a script called Catalanch. So yeah, you know, John Dickinson's been going on about Swift and Cats all for the whole conference. Um, I don't know if it was serendipity or a, or a complete failure of imagination, but I, I went with a, with a, a cat-themed demo. Um, so my magical typey fingers are now looking to see what's in the, the Swift container. Um, it's starting to fill up with images, which is a good sign. Um, and then we'll see what, uh, what content we end up with. So here we have randomly generated cat-themed content with random cat images off the internet. And that's stored, stored in Swift, Swift. Yeah. delivered through MediaWiki. Uh, Steve, should we kill it and finish up so yeah. we can have a chance to have any questions? Kill it, man. Kill cats. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to show the, more, you know, other features, basically. So, nested stacks are um, a way of essentially including another template so that you can, you know, if you have a common application that you, you use, you can, you can define the URL or path to that, uh, to that template and pass in different parameters um, and so you can customize a, a common, like essentially a library. Um, auto scaling uses uh, the, the CloudWatch, so basically you send uh, statistics and it triggers on alarms, and alarms cause either scale up or down depending on, on your scale up, down resources. Um, and we've also added rudimentary monitoring of both the instance and a daemon within your instance. So uh, again, you just send out a heartbeat and it'll make sure that uh, if you don't get that heartbeat within a period of time, it'll trigger alarm and you can restart the instance. The, so the side effect, the, the actions, we could do other things, which just, that was a simple sort of demonstration of what you could do. Um, and the actual monitoring of your daemon within the instance, um, you could either use your own monitoring to do that, but this is a way of being able to send that event to heat and be able to escalate that and do something else. Uh, whether that is sent an email to you or to escalate that to an instance failover or you know, move potentially in the, in the future, move your entire stack to a different cloud, you know, all kind of things we have in the, in the pipeline. So in Grizzly, we've been busy with uh, quite a heap of new features, the YAML templates, quantum resources, nested stacks. Uh, we've got a native API. Uh, we've worked hard on the error reporting, pluggable resources so you can basically add your own resource type. Um, 
version of RPC that came through with work that was done in Oslo, and uh, better Ubuntu support, and proper dev stack integration. Is, is Havana the next version? Yes. I didn't know. I quickly slipped that up. I thought it was still up in the air. <laughs> I prefer um, So, parallel resource creation, we want to do that to, uh, so you can create 100 instances in parallel, basically, and it's not going to do it one by one. Shouldn't be too hard. So. Um, different rollback behaviors, I'll talk about easier. Integration with other projects, maybe. Multi-cloud, uh, basically speaking to more than one keystone and having a layer between the resources and our engines. Yeah, so that integration with, um, with other projects, um, we have a DB instance resource type that, that literally has, a, has an embedded stack which spawns an instance, installs MySQL on it, and, and exposes the, the, the um, you know, a, a DB to the, that you can consume. Um, but there, there are, there are you know, DB as a service projects out there, um, so we're gonna want to um, support those as well. We'll have to decide if, if, if you know, the user chooses to use our internal implementation or the, or the external one, or whether that's something that, that is an admin configuration, or we just, or we just throw away ours and say, you must, you, know, you must have this other service in order to get it done. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll figure out how to do that over time. So um, we do have an Horizon plugin, um, but it's still being worked on. So anyway, uh, some questions. So I've got some answers to questions if you if yeah if, if there's one of those, those questions you really want to know now um, you could ask it um, or otherwise just ask away yes well we communicate with the uh, like for Nova we basically ask for the, the status on the instance yeah. and you know it, just like on the command line you can do the same thing uh, from the Python library and you can and so you can make sure that it's, it's become active essentially so um, to, to watch to see if it's fully completed, you can uh, have a um, await condition, it actually is a, is, which is a rest call out, and it notifies heat, and it will wait on that, and then trigger it to continue. As far as actually monitoring the instance after that point, um, we could, you can hook up something to CloudWatch to be able to notify it back, but essentially it's up to you to hook that mechanism up. I mean, you've got to, you've got to know what to monitor, what is important to you. So, so like, uh, for example, you've got the commands to run on the instance after you install stuff, and I'd like to know, you know which, what, what was the last command that was run? On the instance? Yeah, like you have those commands. Oh, that's, that's, that's not, that's a, yeah, that's at the, the far end. It's, it, it's not in, within the instance. But uh, you, we do store events, and you can query for uh, the events that, so what, what are the actions, what are the state transitions on each resource, essentially within that stack? Yep. Yeah. So you, like, you had uh, an example of installing packages, and then, uh, so especially in the case of uh, a generic image, where there's not uh, a book, So um, at the moment, the instance at very least needs cloud in it, um, and, and you know any cloud-enabled image will will have that. Um, so so cloud image gives us enough to. Click um, on here. Yeah. <coughs> so basically, the key name uh, you pass into Nova Create plus the mul we make a multi-pass message out of the metadata and the user data. Cloud init. This, so that's in the heat engine after the call and after Nova actually starts up the instance, this is in the guest now. Cloud init pulls out a multi-part message, saves the metadata, runs the user script, with, and um, it'll save the key so that you can log in without a password into the instance. You basically have I mean, add stuff into the use data. Yeah, you so can. basically yep. you provide the key, that's one of the arguments you pass to create stack, so it's your key, and the same key you use to log in to the instance. One more question. Thanks. Why YAML? Why restrict yourself to YAML? Particularly the function calls in the middle point. Making your own case of. Um, yeah, you know, that's, that's just the second choice in, in choosing what, what template language you want. You know, we, we, we may well implement an XML-based standard orchestration um, 
like Tosca or something Tosca, else that is know. incredibly complex, but YAML basically converts directly, mechanically from one to the other. I think we're completely open. I think our main focus here is to create, uh, to orchestrate from a file. So if there is uh, a really cool format out there, I think we're all, all ears, essentially. Yeah, one more. You, you made mention of the situation where it's not your cloud. You would made mention of making heat available, get cloud providers to make heat available. Yep. So Wow. Yep. Um, so, how would this work within a multi-tenancy environment, or is that something that's going to be later down the pipe? I think it's still to do, and I think it'll be a cool feature, and we need to think about how that's going to hook in, because uh, you might want to do some pretty cool things like monitor your instances, trigger an alarm that causes your stack to move from one cloud to another, and it would require a bit more thought on, on the monitoring the alarming, what alarming systems you need and, and how do you actually go about moving that. So, and also setting up the different authentication systems on the different clouds too. So basically, that's not supported right now and would need a bit of thought whether we want to do that. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you everyone. And if you Thank you, Angus and Steve, for giving this presentation. Thank you for your time. And on behalf of LCA 2013, here's a little gift for you. Thank you very much.